talk, so we're going to get started. So I hope you are all here to talk about orchestration, because um, that is exactly what we're going to be talking about. So um, I, my name is Sarah Krasnick. Um, I am currently the growth lead at Prefects, which is an orchestration tool, but some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today is really going to be more generic about what do you want from an orchestrator, what do you need, and then how do you actually implement one internally. While I am a growth lead now, I was not always in growth. I was actually a data engineer and led the data engineering team at Perpay, uh, which is in the uh, buy now, pay later e-commerce space. So familiar with both finance and e-commerce, so happy to answer any questions um, about those things at the end. I really like process and documentation, which is one of the inspirations for the talk today is really about what are the, some of the people problems that you might encounter trying to think about orchestration? So before we get too deep into that, the, the two things that I'll really be covering are first requirements of an orchestrator. From a tool, what do you need? What do you want? What's going to help make you successful? And then the second thing is going to be, okay, well, once you've decided here are my kind of minimum viable requirements for an orchestrator, how do you actually go about scaling that out within your organization? Orchestra, right? It's in the name, orchestration. But if you imagine an orchestra, you have a violin section, you have percussion that's hopefully on the same beat as the, the violin section, you also have a conductor that is telling different sections when to go to make sure that they are in sync. And as you see in the picture, it usually does not go like this, right? This is not what you expect when you go to an orchestra, or at least not what I expect. Orchestration, similarly, is really about coordination. It's really about hooking into different tools, making them work well together, and making them work well together in a seamless way that doesn't require engineering lift. So I'm going to talk about a use case, right? We're at Five Trans Conference here. So imagine you have ETL syncs. Say you're an e-commerce platform, right? Let's, let's start there. You're an e-commerce platform. You run marketing campaigns on Google, say Facebook as well, Instagram. So you want to write that marketing data using Five Trans to your warehouse. You're going to run DBT models and DBT jobs on top of that data. Now that's, that's then going to feed into your data science team, right? They're going to run ML models to understand who are your customers, how are they segmented. In what I've just described, there's a clear order there, and I would imagine there's also an SLA, right? You don't want these data science, you don't want these ML models to be a week out of date, maybe even a day out of date, depending on how quickly you're going. So the first, right, use case here is we want to run a few things in a particular order that depend on each other on a schedule. But I'm going to turn it over to, to, to you all here. What features does an orchestrator need to have? So I'm going to ask you guys just to, to yell it out what, what comes to mind. Scheduling. Scheduling, right? That's, that's the first one that we started with. But what else besides that? What if something fails, right? We schedule, it fails. We need to, we need to think about that. We also need to run these things somewhere, and we might want to write dry code, right? All of that, that that's, it's way more than scheduling. So things are always going to fail, so we need to understand when things fail, be notified about those things. We need to be able to de debug the failures, hopefully using logs that are helpful, right, and not just an exception was raised. Um, you're also going to want to write dry code, and what does that entail? That entails having variables and storing secrets in a secure way so you don't have to reinitialize re them every time you want to run something, every three hours or whatever it may be. You also want to share data or share code, right? This is what I'm calling our features of delight, right? The first, things are going to fail. It's, it's not fun, but we all know we have to deal with it. But the features of delight in an orchestrator are really what's going to make your job as an analytics engineer, as a data engineer, as a whole, as a data science team, a broader data team, that's what's, what's going to make it easier. You're going to respond to failures quicker. So now, right, okay, so we've talked about some of, we've talked about some of the features. 
What does it actually take, though, to implement an orchestrator internally? So you sit down, right? There are a variety of different orchestrator tools, Prefect being one of them. Um, so you sit down, you say, okay, what, what needs to happen now? And it's, it's more than just saying, I'm going to run these things on a schedule, click a button. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. And the, the first reason why is because orchestrators and data stacks do not live in a vacuum. You need to integrate different tools that involve a variety of different teams. You need to have infrastructure that runs your job somewhere. When things fail, you need to figure out not only how to deal with those failures, but also how are you going to prevent them, right? That means testing in different environments. So I know I kind of, that, that's, that's a lot. So let's, let's walk through these one by one. First, so we talked about our use case, right? I already mentioned Fivetran and DBT. And what I would consider is the base use case. And that already involves, besides an orchestrator, already involves two different tools. We need to be able to connect to those tools seamlessly without having engineering lift internally. We can't just rely on APIs all the time. Because while we can do that for edge cases, doing that for every single tool that you use, let's look at all the vendors right behind us. It's, it's, they're all very useful tools. And how are we going to integrate all of those? When you think about some of the tools as well, like uh, your, your operational analytics tools, they provide data to different teams, whether it be growth teams like the team that I'm on, whether it be marketing teams, risk teams for fraud detection, they're going to take that data. And when something fails, those teams need to know about it too. So the assumption, right, can't be that, that orchestration and data teams and all of these different things, it, they don't live in a vacuum. So what can you do? Well, first, involve those teams early. It doesn't matter if you haven't coded anything. You don't need to wait to involve those teams until you actually write code. You can do so much earlier by gathering requirements, understanding what they're going to need, and understanding how they want to know when things fail. Right? How do they want to be notified? How, do you, how does the data team work with those stakeholders? And second, which I mentioned briefly, is right, connecting to those different tools. Before you uh, build out your huge internal pipeline, Make sure that you can connect to DBT in the way that works for your organization because everyone's requirements are going to be a little bit different. So now we've thought about connecting internally different teams and connecting different tools. But where are we going to write? We're running pipelines. Where are we going to run these things? One of those teams is DevOps. So we want to also talk to DevOps early and understand what are the infrastructure requirements, what do we need to do to run, whether it be Python workloads, whether it be Spark workloads. Think about infrastructure early, not only what's going to happen on your own computer, but what is it going to look like in production, right? What is that scale going to look like in production outside of your test data set? In addition to that, we also have to think about security, right? Which cloud, whose cloud is it going to run it? Is it going to, is it, are these workloads going to be hosted? Are they going to be run within your own uh, VPC inside AWS, GCP, Azure? Plot these things out in tandem with your DevOps team. So now that we've thought about production, right? We're talking about the production use case. How do we scale these things? How does it work at scale? But we don't only want to test in production. That can't be the only environment that we have. Right. We, we want to have a local environment so we can build on top of that and we can bring in other people to also develop different pipelines. While all things are not caught in test environments, I do believe that they have to exist. And the easier it is to test locally and the easier it is to set up a local environment, the more people are going to test and the more people are going to contribute to the code base that you're building that hopefully is going to be organization-wide. So with that, the, uh, with testing locally, people are going to write, write their own PRs. They're going to write their own code. Now, the, the last kind of step of this is failures, right? And th this is a big one. So no matter how much you test, 
There's no matter whether it's local, no matter no matter whether it's automated unit testing, failures are going to happen. With those failures, you need to understand uh, why they happened, what the dependencies are, right? If something failed, who do you need to notify downstream that either something didn't run or it ran on incorrect data? What's going to happen with that? And you need to automate that alerting so that it's not just a people problem, right? What if the one data engineer that is responsible for a flow is on vacation, right? We can't depend on that one person to notify downstream teams. And with that, when we identify the cause of the failure, we need to be able to rerun our code, not from the beginning, but only rerun the pieces that failed and everything that depends on those pieces downstream. And that's where item potency comes in, right? In terms of writing code that can be run over and over and over again, get the same results so that we can plan for those failures. And with that, I do encourage you to check out Prefect. We try to build a product that thinks about these things in advance and helps you think about these things in advance. Prefect, as an orchestration tool, we coordinate all of the tools that we connect with, being two of them being Fivetran, DBT, among many others. Observe all those connections, visualize the dependencies between them so that when things fail, you can retry only the pieces of your pipeline that actually need to rerun. So that means you're more efficient in the compute that you have. We also help you think about infrastructure by having a cloud product, but allowing you to maintain the pipelines that you run within your own cloud, within your own environment, so that we don't touch that and you can really think about um, whatever, and it be within the security protocols that are the requirements within your organization. And lastly, a direction that we're really headed into is observability. Being a tool that is, by nature, um, batch-based, we need to think about, well, it's not, we, we heard some of the talk, right, on this same stage earlier, that the whole world isn't just batch-based, and we need to have events. We need to be responsive to what's happening, and that's where our observability platform is, is headed, to observe all of the flows within Prefect, as well as all the different tools that uh, Prefect connects to and beyond. Um, and with that, I would love to take any questions. Yes. Yeah, so, so the question was, how do you add data awareness to uh, Prefect? And I think I'm going to answer this in a couple different ways. So I think data awareness, right, you can take it in two different ways. The, the first is the actual data that you're running, right? Is it correct? Just because your pipeline ran doesn't mean that what you expect of your data, right? There could be plenty, even if the pipeline ran, there could be plenty of nulls right, in your data. And so from there, I would actually recommend um, there are different data quality tools to actually write tests on data. Um, some of them are here, um, so some of them aren't, but Prefect would integrate with those. So for example, if you have tests, um, there are also DBT tests, right? So I would uh, write your code in DBT, write your jobs, run tests after that, and make sure that your downstream tasks and flows um, don't run if those tests fail, um, if that is a, a stopper for you. The second um, is in terms of data awareness, I think there's also right, an angle of um, who needs to know about what data and when, and is it, right, is it up to date? And I think there, that's really where um, the uh, events that, that we're building come in of understanding, well, if a certain event happened, that means that everything is okay. And if maybe a certain event didn't happen, or a certain set of events didn't happen over a period of time, um, then things might be broken. And you can build automations on top of that to notify different teams. Um, did that answer your question about data awareness? <clears throat> Great. Uh, anything else? Yes. Yes, this is a great question. So the question was, how are we different from Airflow? And this is one that we uh, get a lot. 
So at, um, at PorPay, uh, when I led the data entering team there, we actually used Airflow. So I've used um, Airflow for a very long time. And some of the things that I encountered with Airflow is what I call Airflow-isms. So it's very specific things that you need to know about Airflow to make you successful. You need to know exactly how the web server is set up. You need to know exactly how the worker interacts with the web server. And you need to uh, debug in Airflow's database um, when things go really, really wrong. Um, it doesn't notify you when the worker is down, which means your flows or your, your Airflow DAGs don't run. And if you have a notification, that is supposed to tell you when those DAGs don't run, if there's nothing to send you this notification, you also don't know about that. So Prefect, we've taken a little bit of a different approach. The first is we want to be very, uh, we want to maintain customizability in terms of saying that anything that can be run in Python should be able to run in Prefect. With that being said, um, we've built different integrations in the form of collections and blocks to integrate with different tools um, seamlessly in a way that Airflow, um, in the way that Airflow has not in an open source way. Now the real, the real magic I think gets into uh, what we call deployments, which is a way to schedule um, your flows. And this is really about how do we scale, right? When you, have, when you have a growing organization, you might have different flows, one for a data science team, one for a marketing team, one for whatever other team, and they have different requirements. In Prefect, that is much easier to manage in terms of being able to uh, run different flows on different nodes and uh, managing specific infrastructure requirements for that one specific flow that could be very different from this other specific flow, which allows you to scale orchestration um, across a variety of teams without having uh, just one team be a bottleneck. Um, the last thing that I will say is uh, while we have an open source product, um, our uh, cloud product has a free tier and then we do offer uh, support with uh, and we do offer support with some of the uh, enterprise tiers in the cloud product, which has really allowed us to show kind of what the best practices are uh, with Prefect to make uh, organizations more successful with Prefect. So that is also an option. Awesome. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.